As we now turn once more to Titus chapter 3, uh, verse 4 to verse 7 uh, is the section we have been dealing with. Uh, this is the third week uh, of our study of Titus uh, chapter 3, verse 4 to 7. Uh, one of the reasons uh, why I wanted to share this portion of the scripture with us was because of how ingrained and drilled, even riveted uh, in our souls is the doctrine of performance-based salvation. That thing is so ingrained in us that it is our default settings. Every single time you think about salvation and how you ought to keep it and maintain it uh, to the point that you are afraid to live and when you are afraid to live you can't even do anything because you are afraid to mess up because one mess up will send you to hell. Mm -hmm. The doctrine that has no security whatsoever that depends on your performance to perform and maintain <coughs> salvation in what we call a sinless perfection life. Brethren, there is no such thing called sinless perfection life. It does not exist. It does not exist. We will never be perfect. And don't get me wrong, we ought to strive for perfection. We ought to live a holy life. We need to pursue holiness for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We ought to do these things. We must do these things. But these things that we do, we have placed salvation in a box that has something called confession which is something we think needs to happen so that salvation is there confession <laughs> and guys this is what we were taught that if you confess you see you gotta confess if it was to happen that you sinned and an accident happened before you confess, I'm sorry, you did not make it because you died just before you confessed. That's it. Is 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 what we 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 we've been conditioned to understand. That it is a performance based. If you, you have to do something and you must confess, if you die without confessing that particular sin, say, give you a, a typical example a moment of weakness happens to you, or me, let's do me as an illustration. Here I am on the road. A guy comes, cuts me off. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Probably even honk. Hey, come on, drive nicely. You will kill us. You know, and then we go again. Then he, he comes again in front of me. Same guy, okay? I mean, you know what happens, right? You, you do know that the flesh rises and uh, uh, there is disrespect happening here and a road rage happens there uh, maybe I get out and I say what are you doing and the guy 
that it's like, what are you going to do about it? And you know, maybe something, you know, unleash five fold ministry on the guy, something, you know, and drive away angry from that situation and boom, in an accident, they are then die. I mean, I'm talking about this thing that's happening this afternoon, you know, that's going to happen to me this afternoon, alright? And I died after that. So, my salvation is lost because of that incident that happened right before the accident. You see? And that is what we are commissioned to be. Is what salvation is about. It is not. It is not. Salvation is not by works. Salvation is by the grace of God. I'm going to get to heaven in spite of that because God is the one who saves. It's not what I do that saves. If it pleased God to save me, I will be saved. And that's the point. And I want you to understand that. It has, it's a dangerous thing to preach. I understand that. I know it sounds like a license for people to sin that we say it anyway. It is not a license. Okay? The scripture says, no, absolutely not. It's not a license. When you take it as a license, then you realize that your fruit, what you want to produce, is a sinful life while you want to also say, I'm saved, but I'm producing not the fruit of the spirit, but the fruit of the flesh. Therefore, you are not in the spirit, but you are in the flesh. And that's a simple thing. That's what we should actually understand. So, the past two uh, weeks we spoke about how this actually is and how this works and uh, we want to continue today uh, but before I do that let's start with the reading of the word of God Titus chapter 3 verse 4 to 7 and it says there but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and a renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out this Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. We looked first at the posture of mankind. We looked at the word but, which takes us back to uh, for we were foolish, disobedient. That was us. That's the posture of mankind without Christ. That's who we are. That's our position. That's what we are. <clears throat> and then we talked about um, the appearing. We talked about uh, the appearing of Jesus Christ. When he appeared, we call that one the personification of God. When he appears, he appears with kindness and love. He demonstrates grace. And when the Bible says, for the grace of God appeared, it talks about Jesus. He is the, the grace of God. He is even the hope of glory. He is these things. He is the personification. We looked at that. And last week we also talked about the performance-based salvation. It says, not by works. Not by what we have done. It is not those things. Should have just said by mercy, but he wants you to understand it. When he says by mercy, he wants to also say that it is not by works. It is not what we have done. It does not come from you. For by grace through faith are you saved, and that not of yourself, not of yourself, and not of works. So that no man can boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ before him. Okay? 
not by works, not by works, not by works, not by works. Please, not by works. It's not about what you have done. Salvation is by faith. And we looked at that last week as well, um, the pity of the divine. We looked at the performance of salvation and we looked at the, uh, the pity of the divine. And it says according to his grace. And I took you to Romans 9 and we looked at that. Romans 9 verse 11 to 16 and it pointed out election according to the purposes of God. It is not by works. It is not by the effort. It is not by the will of man. It is by the compassion of God on us. Let me remind you. The title of this sermon is He Saved Us. He, God, the Savior, the subject, He saved, okay, the action, the activity, the verb, this is what He did, saved us, the object, right, the recipients of the action, the benefactors of the action, us, He saved us. He when it said he saved us and he said how are you saying Say, he saved me that's how he did it I didn't do anything it's him he saved us he saved us but let me just uh, just finish it up uh, for us turn with me first Peter chapter 3 First Peter chapter three, not not chapter three. First Peter chapter one, verse uh, verse three. First Peter one three, uh, three to five. These things are there and are so so clear. First Peter one three. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Christ. Praise Him. Praise Him. I, I want you to see that. It is praise God. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise must be directed to Him. Why? According to His great mercy, He has given us new birth into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, uncorrupted and unfading and kept in heaven for you. You are being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, praise not to me. It is not me who must get the praise for salvation. It is God who must get the praise for salvation. Why? Because of his great mercy. Again, mercy is in play. The pity of God is the one that brings us in. He has given us the new birth according to his mercy. According to his mercy. This is the explanation. It is not what we did. It is not because of our righteous action. It is not because of our wisdom. It is not because of our beauty and charm. It is not because of those things. But it is because of His great mercy. It is because of the kindness of God. It is because of the great love of God. It is because God showed up and had mercy on us. But how was this mercy? Dispensed. How did this mercy come about? How did what what happened then? Is the question. So how did that come about? And I want to lead you to the next uh, aspect of our sermon, uh, which is regeneration. A regeneration. I I couldn't find a, a key word to write with regeneration because all the words for regeneration is a renew, rejuvenate, uh, all those other words. Uh, so, but anyway, from the definition of regeneration, I got the 
plantation of new life. So that's what I'll call it, the plantation of a new life. This is where, what the definition of regeneration is. And, and, and I got this definition from uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Lloyd Jones who says, uh, regeneration means the implantation of a new life in the soul. That's in a nutshell. The implantation of a new life in a soul. That's what the regeneration is. The verse says there, he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to talk about today, is this regeneration. It is this regeneration. Maybe a, a broader definition of regeneration here, it says it is the act of God by which a principle of new life is implanted in a man or a woman with the result that the governing disposition of the soul is made holy. The governing of disposition, the governing disposition of the soul is made holy. You're like, what are you talking about? You have all your faculties inside of you, your decision-making process, okay, your thoughts, your will, all those things, your affections and all those things, they are there inside you. There is something behind them that governs them. It's called a disposition. Now, this disposition is what helps you make decisions you make. The decisions you're making, you either have a good disposition or a bad disposition, and it will guide you to wherever you that you're gonna go. If your disposition is that one of a sinful nature, we can clearly say, well, we know what you're gonna choose because this is who you are. This is what governs you. What governs you is why do you have a guy? You can take two people, same talents, same everything, same, same, same intellect, same thing. Okay, the other one becomes evil and the other one becomes good. Why would you have that? It is that governing disposition thing. That is what gets regenerated. That's what God changes inside of you. He puts life into that. The life that causes this thing to guide you and channel you to the things that are different. For example, you have the thief at the cross who has been a, a killer and a thief, a notorious guy throughout his life and there he is at the cross of Jesus Christ on the other side when the other guy is doing what he normally does. He's shouting and yelling insults at Jesus and all that. That guy all of a sudden says, stop, stop, this is not right. All of a sudden, <laughs> The gentleman who is evil and is now being crucified for what he normally does, for what he loves doing, he would not even repent probably, is now the one who says to the other guy, stop it, stop it. And he begs Jesus for his life in eternity. Do, do you see that guy? What changed in this guy? The faculties of his process of making decisions had to change completely. Complete. That is what we're talking about when we talk about regeneration. Is that implantation into that disposition of a man. Let me give you another example. The Apostle Paul, vigorous guy, passionate, a Jew, attacks the church, hates the church. He's called Saul of Tarsus. He 
believes that Jesus is not the, the Son of God and all that, and he goes passionately and he does what he has to do. The killing of Stephen. He's on his way, breathing insults and everything, going to Damascus. And then something hit him. A change of disposition. When the Apostle Paul turns around and starts preaching the gospel he once hated, the same things are there. The same logic, the same power, the same passion. He's the same guy. Just different disposition. Just different disposition. He, and he's, he becomes the greatest preacher. He becomes, because he was doing, he was great all along. It doesn't make you to increase intellect or other, no. It's just that governing thing. That's what the regeneration is about. That's what the regeneration speaks to. It speaks of a renewed disposition. In there. That's from a, a doctor who is a theologian talking these things. Something uh, I want to highlight here. This word regeneration is used twice only in scripture. Twice only here. It is used in our verse here and it is also used in Matthew 19 verse 28. Now Matthew 19 verse 28 is in that context where Peter talks to Jesus and he says to Jesus, uh, Lord look we have left everything to follow you and all that. And Jesus is answering him and he says in verse 28, I assure you that when everything is made new, when regeneration happens, when the messianic age happens, uh, when renewal happens, when new world order happens, when rebirth happens, you will get a hundredfold of everything you have given up. So it is, it is that word used, but it is used in the sense of the millennial, or, or the, not the millennial kingdom, but the new heaven and new earth, when Jesus sits on the throne, for future restoration of everything, or recreation of everything. In our text, that one is speaking in general terms of all of creation. But in our text, it speaks to individual regeneration. And that's what uh, we see here. So this, this speaks about the salvation of our souls. It, it really, what it does is it points to what we call the mechanics of salvation. And I know, and I'm aware of this, that what, when we talk about these things on regeneration and things like that, what we're doing is just actually splitting hair. That's what we're doing. But it is also important to understand the processes and what happens at salvation when you're getting saved. What happens when you came to Christ? What actually happened to you and inside of you? It's very important to also know that. Yeah, I think for me, it solidifies my stance and my position in Christ and it grants me the blessed assurance I have in Him because of my understanding of these things. And so I I want to employ this method to explain the salvation. He saved us, how mercy, regeneration, and all this. How did that happen? I want to talk about the, just to give you the order of salvation. How salvation actually happens. The order of it. Some people differ with how the, the order should be laid out. I believe this, this is more accurate to the word of God and it's more logical uh, to think about it as well. It's pretty logical. So I would say the first thing, the first thing is eternity past. That I want you to see, eternity past. 
in eternity past, God in his foreknowledge, or as we say, in the intertrinitarian council, and I know you don't like me talking like that, uh, in the inter-Trinitarian council, before everything was made, there was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they decided on what to make and what will happen on the earth and everything that transpired on the earth. Even the future that we're still waiting for was decided in eternity past by the Godhead. That's what happened. So in eternity past, God made decisions. Decisions there. Those decisions are what are what is happening even today. So in eternity past would be the first thing that happened. God making a decision there and God choosing. The Bible says he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. So if election is before the foundations of the world, and by the way, not only election, but the names, the names in the Lamb's Book of Life were written before the foundations of the world. Before God created it, He already had names. Okay? So you have election, you have uh, inter-Trinitarian council, eternity past, election, predestination, Okay, what God chose, God predestined and made sure that it will accomplish its purposes and it will arrive to the destination that God wanted. So predestination was done as well. This is where it will arrive. This is how it will navigate. This is how it will go. Okay, that was also done. And then we got what we call the gospel calling. The gospel calling. So for you to be saved, God in eternity past decided to save you, then he chose you, uh, out of the man he chose you, and then predestined that the gospel will come to you in unit 6 uh, on the 6th of September uh, around 11 or just before 12. This will happen to you. God has ordained that. God makes sure that the preacher is not sick. God makes sure that our church is able to meet even when other churches are not meeting. God makes sure that these things, all the pieces of the puzzle are all together there so that that day comes because God predestined it to happen. Unless the predestination uh, somehow displays the weak hand of God. I don't think there is such a thing called the weak hand of God. So therefore, on that day, the gospel call is made. Salvation is proclaimed. God organizes the preacher. God organizes a text. The preacher understands the text. The preacher is explaining the text. The preacher says a word that will strike your soul and this thing happens. The gospel call. Effectual call. And it's happening in time when you are alive. That happens. Remember it started in eternity past but it happened, it's happening in your life. And then when the gospel call is made, regeneration happens. <clears throat> but how? When the word of God is proclaimed, the word, isn't it? The Bible says, for we are born not of perishable seed, but imperishable. And it's talking about the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So the word of God is an essential component for regeneration to happen in your soul. When the word of God is implanted, uh, remember the parable of the sower. When the word of God is implanted and the Holy Spirit germinates that thing and plants it right into your soul and it's not the seed that fell on the road or on the road, but in your soul. Regeneration is there. Life is given there by the power of the Holy Spirit and the washing. This washing here, this is the washing of your soul, not the washing of uh, uh, getting in the baptismal thing or your uh, 
uh, and soap uh, and the sanitizing stuff. That's not what this is. This is spiritual. Regeneration is spiritual. It happens to you inside of you, to your soul. Spiritual. Okay? That's what it is. And then after that we have conversion. And I know uh, this is where some people uh, kind of want to swap them around like that. Uh, but you have conversion. Conversion is an outward thing. It's not like regeneration. It is different from regeneration in that conversion. Is a, is, it's like a U-turn. It's a change. Um, it, it's an outward thing. It is when you now confess your sins. It is now when you repent and demonstrate faith. That is confession. You were now going that direction and now you're going that direction. That's a physical thing that we see. You changed. It's what comes because of regeneration. Conversion comes because of regeneration. Without regeneration, you will not turn. You need something supernatural so that you can turn. Okay? I'll explain that a little bit later. Then we have what we call justification. Justification, and obviously I've put uh, uh, implication there um, as we understand. I'm justified not because I'm just but because he is just. So his justice is placed on me. His righteousness is placed on me. My sin, the great exchange, my sin on him. And uh, um, I, I, when, when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ. And therefore I'm able to stand before God. And then we have union with Christ. And that's where we have relationship and adoption. That's what comes because now I've been made righteous and I am right with God and I'm adopted and I'm made heir together with Christ and I will inherit heaven as well. And obviously you have sanctification which is that the process of making one holy. It is how God makes us holy but uh, sanctification talks in three ways. It talks about positionally I am holy, I'm a saint, I am changed. God has separated me and put me aside. I'm holy. And then I keep on working towards holiness. I keep on shaving all these branches that do not bear fruit. Uh, the Father helping me and shaping me and, and cutting off all these things. And I'm progressing and I'm changing. I used to be like this. I am no longer like that. I'm becoming more holy every day. Uh, I'm renewed day by day into the image and the likeness of Jesus, uh, so to speak. Uh, but also, in his position, I stand perfected because his work is done uh, as well. So that's sanctification. And then we have what I call perseverance and preservation. Okay? So you have perseverance that you must hold on, but God also holding you also. So it's, it's a dual thing. It's not just one-sided. You are required to hold on. God provides you with everything you need to hold on. He gives you your brethren to walk with you so that you don't give up. He gives you his word so that you get encouragement to continue to forge forward. He gives you his spirit who walks with you and he is in you to help you go on as well. He is preserving us. And we are also persevering as well. So, lastly, it's obviously the glorification. When he comes, we shall be like him. <clears throat> we will be, the process of salvation will be completed. We always talk about salvation in these three sense of we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. So it's past, present, and future. Uh, we're still here. When he comes, he saves us. Uh, he's already saved us. Because why? It's done in eternity past. He is doing it every day because he is busy working in us. For he who began a good work in you shall perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
again, uh, that's what it is. That's what it is. And this washing, as I've said, it's not a baptism, it is the washing inside of us. That's regeneration. We understand it sometimes as to be born again, or new creation, or recreation. It is this regeneration. You remember John chapter 1, verse 13? Not by the will of man, not by blood, mm. but by God. Okay? It comes from God. Mm. This thing is of God. You remember John 3, verse 3, the discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus says, uh, we know you are from God, the things you do are evidence, we know, uh, but what must I do uh, to get into the kingdom, to enter the kingdom? And Jesus says, you cannot see the kingdom unless you are born. You can't see unless you are born. You must be born first, and then you will see me. And it's like, you mean I should go back into my mother's womb? And it's like, no, I'm talking about the spiritual thing, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Mm -hmm. And you don't understand it, you don't see it. You just see the effects of it. You can't control it. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. You can't predict it. It is supernatural, it is silent, and it is spiritual. Mm -hmm. It happens to you. And that's what he's talking about. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man is in Christ, is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, it has become new. That's who you are. Remember Ezekiel 36, verse 36, I will give them a new heart. I will remove the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh. I will cause them to walk in my statutes. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Remember that? Let me close with this verse and I want to read it. Um, it's in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Uh, in verse 18. James 1 verse 18. By his own choice, he gave us a new birth by the message of the truth so that we will be first fruits of his creatures. By his own choice. <laughs> he gave us a gift. He gave us new birth. And it came, like I told you, faith comes by hearing and hearing the way, by the message of truth. So that we would be first fruits of his creatures. He saved us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you today. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. So potent, so powerful, so sufficient for our souls. And I pray, I pray, O oh God, that your word will dwell in our hearts richly reach that from our souls will overflow as streams of living waters to touch other lives in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh God, that your word will not return void. We ask, O oh Father, that the seed not be stolen by the birds of the air. Let it produce and bear fruit in each and every one of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.